<clears throat> what is up, good people of the world? I finally have an overhead piano view. I moved my piano in my closet, so <laughs> goodness me. Okay, I have been wanting to make this video for a long time, so I'm really excited. Um, this is uh, the next episode of Harmonic Relativity. So I've been thinking about a lot of different harmony things. I've been playing a lot of piano. I've been doing a lot of experimentations. I'm listening to a lot of music. And I have some principles that I would like to share with you. And, uh, and this is a, just my way of thinking. It's very subjective. Uh, I want you to just think of it as a tool to kind of add to your own toolbox and expand it and mess with it and change the rules and do whatever you want with it. I'm just kind of uh, giving this to you all as a, uh, a present. So um, I'm going to be going over seven different points. Okay, so first I'm going to be talking about symmetry, right, and conceptualizing. And I'll go through all these in detail with demonstrations. Um, so number one, symmetry. And uh, we're going to be talking about how symmetry and harmony with regards to scales and shapes is kind of like yin-yang. Symmetry and asymmetry is kind of like a, a kind of, can be used as a sort of tension and release in a very meta sense, which can help guide a sense of emotional narrative and coherency. Because a lot of people think, once I get outside of, you know... You know, once we get out of, uh, uh, you know, diatonicism, then it's just like, well, we can do anything. Well, it's like, well, I mean, you can, and there's nothing wrong with that. And it's intellectually interesting if you do interesting things. But the heart, the soul, tends to like a tension and release, right? Um, and uh, you can stretch the tension, or you can stretch the release, you can play around with things. And, uh, you know, we also don't like things to be too predictable, but at the same time, not too chaotic, finding a balance between those two things. But anyway, but yeah, this can kind of be converted into thinking about symmetry versus asymmetry, um, uh, which we'll talk about. So the second thing is pivots, right? And not just thinking about like pivot chords, but thinking about pivot notes, pivot embellishing tones, and using those to quote unquote modulate between different scales and pitch collections in a really smooth way. And then I'll also talk about uh, melody. A lot of what we're going to be talking about today is not just the harmony, but also how the melody goes with the harmony, which is something that a lot of people have asked me as well. Um, because my first video that I made a long while back was really just a simple way to shake up your way of thinking about chord progressions by kind of isolating um, certain sounds that you like, you know, uh, and then being able to do them in various keys and kind of abstract that out. But we're going to take that further um, with this idea of pivot. So three, we're going to talk about chunking, how chords really don't think of the major seventh just as its own entity, although it is. It's also really just a minor chord and a major chord mixed together, right? So that's one of the reasons why major seventh chords and minor seventh chords have a similar kind of relaxation because they're both just a major triad mixed with a minor triad, but reversed. And you can go an even deeper level and look at major and minor chords. A major chord and minor chord both have a major third and a minor third. It's just swap which one is which. Minor chords have the minor third first and the major third um, uh, major chords have. And uh, the lower interval is always more significant to the ears because of the overtone series and uh, we'll talk about that as well. But anyway, so chunking, thinking about things in various elements. You know, augmented chords are two major thirds, diminished chords are two minor thirds, so they're symmetrical. That's why they sound a little bit more unsettled. That goes back to our idea of symmetry. So yeah, again, we'll go over all of this in, in more detail. I'm just kind of laying it out ahead of time. And then I also want to talk about circle of fifths extension, right? So not just having seven note adjacent pitch collections on the circle of fifths, because if you go in the circle of fifths, if you just draw seven adjacent notes, excuse me, that gives you a pitch collection, right? So like, you know, for example, and if we go the other way from C, well, I'll go to F sharp, doesn't matter. But, you know, here, G major, C Lydia, and A Dorian, however you want to think about it, it is a seven note diatonic pitch collection in the circle of fifths, right? Um, so you can also make distinctions like that. Okay, you know, I'm modulating around and I'm doing all kinds of crazy stuff and I'm mixing up all the seven modes, but you're still staying within that modal framework of the circle of fifths, which is really just an interval cycle. You're just, and it comes from 12 tone equal temperament, but uh, we'll get, again, we'll get into that uh, later. Um, so uh, circle of fifths extension, thinking about eight note pitch collections and nine note pitch collections, not just seven note pitch collections. And how can we incorporate those into our voicing in a way that sounds palatable to the ear and not too, too wacko. <laughs> so that's number four. Number five is voicing, which is very important. And uh, the two main concepts that go into that are, of course, overtones and also um, a, a continuum of dissonance. Uh, which we'll talk about. Uh, number six, there's seven. Uh, number six is connections between the scales, right? So um, 
uh, for example, if you take like uh, the Lydian scale and the octatonic scale, you might think, oh, the Lydian scale is all bright and happy. And the octatonic scale is all, you know, uh, unsettled and anxious and mysterious. Right? A little bit exotic, maybe. Um, well, if you look, we actually have quite a bit in common. These notes, C, E, F sharp, G, and A, and we'll go through some more examples later in detail. Between C Lydian and uh, C octatonic, that starts with a half step, very similar. So I can easily switch harmonically. Right, you can get really interesting sounds that where you're using those notes as bridges. So at the moment at which you transition from one pitch collection to the other, you're using those as a kind of connection. So it sounds smooth to the ear. Um, number seven is recycling shapes with different um, uh, functions. So for example, this shape, I really like this shape. Um, it's uh, got a lot of different intervals in it. Um, doesn't have a tritone in it. It's got a fourth and it's got a fifth, it's got a sixth, but at the same time, so you know, a lot of really constant intervals. Um, uh, but it also has uh, some dissonances, right? Uh, inner second, inner second. And so it gives it this kind of mixture of like uh, dissonance and consonance that I really like. And you can use this with every single solitary chord of the diatonic pitch collection. So say this is a part of C major, right? Well, look, it sounds really nice. So I'm just going to go through all the chords from A minor all the way down to B diminished, all right? So look, I'm using this on top of A minor. Beautiful. Using it on top of G major gives it a kind of like add four sound, which is kind of like, uh, you know, Jacob Mint. Right? But anyway, on F, it's like Lydian. Really nice. Love that. And then on E minor, it's really nice. Which almost sounds kind of like a C major in first inversion with a major seventh on it. And then D Dorian. Oh, beautiful. Right, I was like to play. You can play it as a shape melodically in addition to thinking of it vertically as a harmonic sonority. And then finally C major. Or penultimately, I should say. And then of course even B diminished. Right? Sounds kind of nice. It's just like a really salty kind of like, you know, like a you know, something like that, it might sound nice in context. Um, anyway, all right, so let's go through these in detail. But this first video is just going to be on point one. So I'm going to do uh, six more after this, and I'm going to go through all of these um, in detail. So first, we're going to be talking about symmetry, all right? And don't worry, I'm recording all these in one day, so I'll actually be able to post them and finish the series. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah, let's start with talking about symmetry, all right? So, firstly, um, the easiest way to build symmetrical sonorities um, in 12-tone equal temperament... Well, well, firstly, we should talk about 12-tone equal temperament. So, um, 12 equidistant tones um, has its disadvantages, as Jacob Collier and musicians have pointed out. It's not perfectly in tune with the overtone series. Our major third is 14 cents sharper than it would be in the harmonic series, and our perfect fifth is 2 cents flatter than it would be in the harmonic series. Uh, people can correct for this, you know, but you still have to be using some reference that is built on equal temperament if you're going to be using fixed tuning instruments like, for example, a piano with barbershop quartet or with a string ensemble. That might be a different story. But anyway, I digress. My point um, is simply that with the number 12, we have a lot of factors, right? So 12 is divisible by 1, divisible by 2, 3, 4, and 6. For such a small number, it packs quite a factorial punch. And uh, so, therefore, that means there are lots of various kinds of symmetries that can be created with this number. Uh, in other words, repetitive uh, interval cycles that do not encompass all 12 notes. Think about it as like a 12-note clock face, chromatically. And um, so, for example, uh, let's just go. Th let's just go through these, right? So there are two categories. Um, there are sort of you can think of them as like prime numbers or factors, but to put it in less mathematical terms and in more kind of like spatial terms, just think of it like this. There are, there are pitch collections that contain all 12 pitches, and then there are, and I call those aggregates, right? Just because that's what set theory calls them. It means they contain all 12 pitches. So the circle of fifths is an example of this. It contains all 12 pitches. Um, 
And, uh, and then there are subsets, all right, which are repetitive interval cycles that are perfectly symmetrical, but they don't include all 12 pitches. They include a division, so um, any number that's divisible by 12. So let's go through all of them. So if we were to label these pitches as numbers, um, we can do this arbitrarily starting on any note, but I'm just going to start on C to be simple, right? We think of this as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And it becomes easier to sort of see these once you figure out the symmetry because you kind of know intuitively how numbers function. You know, there's different me thinking of numbers is just oh these are the numbers one two three four five it's just one after the other they're all the same right or thinking about the fact of what you know thinking about the patterns the resultant geometrical patterns that happen from some numbers as opposed to other numbers like the difference between a prime number and a number that has factors but again not to get too mathematical with it if we just think of these as labeling pitches well what if we took the, the number one we can go up one or in base 12 just like we have base 10 you know one through uh, zero through eleven uh, 0 through 9, base 10, 0 through 11 with base 12. You know, 0 is really the first number, not 1. 1 is the start of a new set. Anyway, <clears throat> if we take uh, the interval cycle 1 slash 11, so we could say up 1 or negative 1 is the same thing as up 11 or negative 11, right? So that is just the chromatic scale. It's repeating major 7s uh, or minor seconds in either direction. It includes all 12 pitches. It's the chromatic scale. That's all that it is. Very simple, all right? And that is an aggregate. It contains all, right, or, right, which is really just going up, down, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> but um, anyway, don't overthink that, the chromatic scale, all right? Now, the next one, the subsets are what I'm going to be focusing on for now, because that's what's going to give rise to our symmetrical pitch collections and vertical sonorities, which we're going to be using um, as tensions that release into asymmetrical sonorities. But anyway, let's go to the next one. So, two and ten. Right? Right, so the minor seventh and the major second are inversions of one another. They're the 210. If we uh, cycle them, the Dalton scale, right? And you all know this sound. You know, Sesame Street, Dreamland. You know? Uh, Debussy, um, um, you know, French Impressionism, uh, not to tie it to a particular style. Um, but anyway, uh, so the whole tone scale is just taking a bunch of major seconds and repeating them. And there are two of them, right? Because 2 times 6 equals 12, and 6 times 2 equals 12, right? So we have two subsets. You can sort of isolate them as, I guess, pentagons? No, pentagons are five. Wait, no, hexagons. Ah, I don't remember the names of the shapes, but shape, two shapes that have six sides. Uh, and they combine together to make a dodecahedron, I think is what 12, <laughs> doesn't matter, name is blah, blah, blah. But, uh, so those are the whole tone scales, all right? The whole tone scale is completely symmetrical. And let me talk a little bit about why I think symmetry has this sense of kind of, well, here's what's interesting, okay? Symmetry and asymmetry, let's th think about how those correlate to our human emotional feelings when we listen to it, all right? With rhythm, this is really fascinating. I found personally that symmetry and asymmetry and rhythm has, in some sense, the opposite effect that symmetry and asymmetry within the context of scales and harmonic sonorities, all right? Because those are kind of two different things. I mean, really, it's all rhythm at different levels of abstraction because waveforms are just rhythms. But anyway, I digress. Um, <laughs> don't worry about that for now. <laughs> Think of them as separate, right? Um, with rhythm, the more symmetrical the rhythm is... <laughs> Uh, or the more repetitive it is, however you want to think about that, um, and consistent it is, the more it's kind of like, yeah, we're grooving, we're good, you know? And then when things get like... A... Right, then we're like, whoa, what's going on, right? So uh, the tension and rhythm is, often comes from asymmetry, and the release is like, ah, back into symmetry, right? But with uh, in the context of... Um, uh, scales, it's, it's, it's the opposite, right? So with scales, if they're symmetrical, unlike with rhythm, it makes you feel like, where am I? I have no frame of reference. I'm in the middle of the ocean. I have, I can't see the stars. I can't use my sextant. I don't have a compass. I can't feel magnetic. Where am I going? I'm in space. What's up or down, right? You know, at least in the ocean, you have gravity, right? Uh, <laughs> so that's kind of how I, I think about it. I think about it as sort of a landscape, right? And that feels, where are we? And... Even if we land in some place that has dissonance, it still feels like in some meta sense a release from the confusion of uncertainty of symmetry. Because really what that translates to in a very literal way is your ear doesn't know what scale degree is different from any other scale degree. The whole tone scale, every scale degree is just surrounded by the same intervals. That's 
all uniform, right? And there are some scales that are partially symmetrical, right? Um, and again, there are technical set theoretical definitions for this, but I'm going to avoid them because I don't think they're necessary. I'm going to explain it with shapes. So um, anyway, the multiple scale, right? So what's the next one? We were going through uh, the major second and minor seventh as inversions of one another, which is two and ten, right? Both divisible by two. <laughs> so uh, what about three and nine, right? So that's the minor third and the major sixth. If we repeat that, we get a fully diminished seventh chord. We in fact have, well, one, uh, sorry, <clears throat> four times three equals 12. So we have three different fully diminished seventh chords. These are often labeled as zero, one, and two, which I like labeling with numbers like that because it actually makes it simpler. Because if you're thinking about this, what is like, is it C diminished? Is it e, uh, C fully diminished seven? Is it E flat fully diminished seven? Is it G flat fully diminished seven? Once you get into, well, let me explain this. Accidentals and our key signatures are predicated on seven note subsets of the circle of fifths, which is actually a very specific way and framework of thinking, very ingenious and beautiful in many ways. Um, which we'll talk about later, but it is a limited expression of all these 12 pitches, right? Um, so, what, in other words, inharmonic spelling, F sharp versus, you know, G flat and stuff like that, is completely irrelevant once you start getting into symmetrical pitch collections, as any music engraver trying to figure out how to spell a whole tone scale has discovered. So, <laughs> um, uh, anyway, once you get with uh, the octatonic, uh, sorry, <laughs> I spoiled the punchline! Damn it! Uh, if you take a, a fully diminished seventh chord, right? There are three of them, as I said. Well, there's an interesting thing that we can do. So if we combine together, obviously all of them, we just get the aggregate again. Nothing special. Just like if we combine together both whole tone skills, we get the aggregate. But since we have three different fully diminished seventh chords, which is still an interval cycle, we, we might tend to think of this as a chord and this as a scale. But that's an arbitrary distinction that we're making um, uh, with our mind. It's the same thing. It's an interval cycle. It's just a pitch collection with a particular pattern. That's the best way of thinking about it in the most neutral way. Anyway, we can combine together two of them. We have the option to combine together two and get a subset, right? So what happens if we do that? Well, we get, behold, the octatonic scale, also known as the diminished scale. Right, uh, in jazz context, it's also... often used in uh, action, horror, you know, uh, in film music, it's a really juicy kind of scale, but I like it because it's partially asymmetrical, partially symmetrical. It's mostly symmetrical because it does have a repeating pattern. The resultant pattern is, of course, alternating half steps and whole steps, right? So if we have three different fully diminished seven chords, A, B, C, how many different combinations of two of them do we have? Well, we have A and B, we have B and C, and we have A and C, right? So three different combinations. So that means that we have three different octatonic scales, and we can label them as the one containing C, the one containing C sharp, and the one containing D, just the roots of those fully diminished seventh chords. You know, you can think about it um, uh, in that way. Or sorry, no, you, you, you want to use two numbers. Sorry, so, so either we have... O1, O2, or 1, 2. Those would be the three options if you want to label the octonic scales like that, again, without referring to a particular root, um, as you might want to do in a tonal context. But anyway, but so that's another really interesting uh, uh, symmetrical pitch collection that we have that we'll think of a kind of tension, right? So think about how 5, 1 is just tension and release. And a very, everyone's familiar with that tension and release, a very specific kind of tension and release. Tritone resolving, uh, you know, um, just going from something, and then the voice leading is smooth as well, but um, I'm not going to talk too much about voice leading today, we'll talk about that later. But anyway, my point is tension and release, right? Yin yang. So just replace that concept in your head with symmetry, asymmetry. We're going from symmetry and then we're releasing into asymmetry. So for example, and you can do this as in, uh, you don't even have to think about particular placements of these chords or scales. So I could start with A minor. <laughs> Let's just say I'm just going to go to this octatonic scale, right? So I think, okay, I've got these notes that come with A minor. So I think... Right? That's just such a cool, mysterious sound. It sounds like a bit of tension and release, but really all that we're doing is... And I'm thinking, isolating even more, you know, because like the way that I think about it, if we look at this octatonic scale... Right? I'm just looking at all the modal similarities to we have as well. Like we've got this in common with Dorian, right? We have um, uh, this in common with Phrygian, right? 
We have, uh, you know, uh, this in common with Lydian. Again, we've got all these modal similarities. So I can sit here and be like, okay, well, this can turn into this, right? Um, this can turn into, you know, uh, B flat if you want. So I could go. Phrygian. Right? Really cool sounds, right? Okay, but uh, anyway, uh, just to show you one uh, particular example. So that's the octonic scale, the diminished scale, which is created from combinations of two fully diminished seventh chords. And remember, we were on the interval cycle 3-9, so what's the next one? Well, it happens to be 4-8, which is the major third and minor six. And uh, this gives you the augmented chord. And this is actually a subset of the whole tone scale. So each whole tone scale contains two augmented chords, right? And uh, you can combine them together uh, if you want, right? Which is really kind of cool. Right? And uh, the whole tone scale, again, it might sound like, whoa, it's crazy, but it's actually in terms of dissonance, not that dissonant. It has tritones in it, right? But it has a lot of consonants. So let's look at what all the intervals are. Uh, major second, minor seven, not too bad. It's like a, a soft dissonance. Major third, very nice. Of course, we have the tritone. And then major six, and then we go back, right? So there aren't any, right? So in a weird way, the whole tone scale is less dissonant intervolically in terms of its intervolic quality than just a C major scale, even though it's more conceptually or emotionally unsettling in another sense because of its symmetry, right? So thinking about these different parameters and axes can really help you to organize yourself without being bogged down by particular manifestations such that you fall into patterns that ossify your stylistic potential. So, um, uh, yeah, augmented chords. And then the next one is really interesting, of course, the perfect fourth, which inverts to the fifth as well. And that, of course, gives us the, uh, the, the circle of fifths. And, uh, there are a lot of ways you can use the circle of this besides just choosing seven note pitch collections. But if you take a seven note pitch collection and you put it in uh, one octave, then you get our standard, you know, scales, major and minor scales. Um, but, uh, but anyway, yeah, so now let's think about using a little bit of this in context. But I'm also going to show you another example. Uh, uh, so there's one last thing. What was it? Uh, well, after uh, interval cycle five, seven, five and seven are both prime numbers, it just becomes six. And the tritone is interesting. And it is the only interval that is symmetrical, which is one of the reasons why it sounds unsettling, right? It's not that vertically dissonant, but it's very conceptually dissonant, you know, or emotionally dissonant. It doesn't have the same bite that that has because it doesn't constrict so much within the continuum of dissonance. You know, there's really a continuum of dissonance. If you think of an octave, things are more dissonant on the fringes, and then they get more consonant the closer you get. Tritone is kind of like the split, right? So the tritone really is a very special interval um, uh, in that way. But anyway, uh, the last thing that I had to say is that if we take two augmented chords, uh, you might have thought of this, of from different whole tone scales, we get a really interesting scale, sometimes called the hexatonic scale. Um, John Williams uses this for Star Wars a lot. So let's say we take C augmented and we take, um, oh, I don't know, uh, C sharp augmented, right? Then we get this interesting scale, right? And the one that starts with the half step, and then it's alternating half steps and minor thirds. The one that starts with a half step is really, really fun. It's very, very uh, kind of mysterious and spooky. It's very Radhavari, and if you've ever heard of Inuit Johani Radhavara, um, very difficult to spell name. I think it's E I N O J U H A N I R A U T A V A A R A. <laughs> that might be wrong, but something like that. Um, uh, he uses that kind of stuff all the time. But the Star Wars one is starting with the minor third, right? So think about this is where the... You know, you know that sound. That's the Star Wars sound. Well, if you use the whole scale, that's really Star Wars. Right? Um, uh, but anyway, but again, that's tying it to a film score, but you can just use it in your own way. You can use them in context like that. So now I'm just gonna play a little bit for you and see if I can demonstrate just going back and forth between symmetrical landscapes of, of pitch collections and asymmetrical. So thinking of it as tension and uh, release. So I hope you guys have fun. Good luck uh, practicing with this stuff. Always make yourself emotionally involved. Practice should never mean emotionally distancing yourself or going into intellect mode because then you're just desensitizing yourself to music. Uh, that's my two cents worth. Anyway, I hope you guys have a fantastic week and I will see you in the next episode. Adios.